Chapter 12, Manifest Destiny. The differences and conflicts between the people of the North, the South, and the West were becoming irrevocably dire. Their shared territorial ambitions drove settlers to conquer more than 1 million square miles of the continent in the 1840s alone. A million square miles of settlement. Driven by an idealistic vision of social perfection, pioneers believed that America was destined by God and by history to expand from the Atlantic Ocean on the East Coast to the Pacific Ocean on the West. It was the same impulse that made ordinary people into social reformers. Manifest destiny was the notion that an empire of liberty unique to the earth could be built upon the American continent. The movement inspired generations of idealists to brave the peripheries of the American frontier. White America's westward ambitions stretched back decades. The expansion of influence and territory off the continent became an important corollary to westward expansion dating back to the American Revolution. The U.S. government codified its efforts to keep European countries out of the Western Hemisphere with the Monroe Doctrine and applied the principles of Manifest Destiny in its decades-long clashes with Indian tribes. Andrew Jackson's attitude toward Indian tribes, for instance, was brutally simple. They would, be, they would willingly make way for white progress or be forced to do so. Since his early military expeditions in Florida, Jackson had harbored a deep hostility toward Indians, not unlike most Americans in this time. The most of Jackson's political forefathers had viewed Indians as noble savages with an inherent dignity that made civilization possible among them. By the early 19th century, most Americans agreed that Indians were simply savages who should be removed to lands west of the Mississippi River. We've already talked about Jackson, but he comes up. His legacy will, will continue here. Westerners also favored removal to put an end to the violence on the frontier, though they mostly wanted easy access to tribal lands. The final transfer of Florida from Spain to the United States in this era uh, via the adams onis Treaty provided an early test of federal and state Indian removal efforts. The adams onis Treaty will give the United States legal recourse to attempt this. Many Indian tribes fought back against forced relocation. While well, vicious conflicts like the Black Hawk War in the Great Lakes region uh, define the viciousness of the conflicts the Cherokee tried to stop the state of Georgia from taking their lands by appealing directly to the Supreme Co uh, Court instead of raising arms. But the Supreme Court found favor with the tribe, Jackson repudiated the decisions of the court and sent an army of 7,000 American soldiers to round up the Cherokee and drive them westward. Roughly 1,000 Cherokee fled North to Carolina where their descendants still live today. The majority of natives though made the long trek to Indian territory in modern day Oklahoma beginning in the winter of uh, 1838. Thousands died along that journey on the march, and the survivors remembered the terrible journey as the Trail of Tears. Trail of Tears. There are, there are many forced relocations, but that's one of the earliest and one of the one of the most profoundly remembered. Of the five civilized tribes of the American Southeast, and those are the Cherokee, the Creek, the Seminole, the Chickasaw, and the Choctaw, five civilized tribes, only members of the Seminole tribe in Florida and the escaped slaves, African slaves living in their midst, were able to resist the pressure to emigrate west. When, uh, when they defeated the American army in the Everglades. Other Indian groups remained too powerful to remove for a time. Beginning in the late 18th century, the Comanche rose to power in the Southern Plains region of what is now the Southwestern United States. By quickly adapting to the horse culture first introduced by the Spanish, the Comanche people transitioned from a foraging economy into a mixed hunting and pastoral society. They used raiding and captive taking to threaten Mexican and American control of the Southern Plains for decades, the terror of the plains, the Comanche. Efforts by leaders like Black Hawk to resist removal by federal troops only in a sense gave removal effort momentum. By 1840, Indian tribes had ceded over 100 million acres to the United States federal government in return for $68 million and 32 million acres of far less hospitable land west of the Mississippi. There many now lived divided by tribe and into separate series of reservations and a territory surrounded by a string of US Army forts. While there was probably never any realistic possibility that the United States government could actually stop white expansion westward, there were alternatives proposed to the brutal removal uh, policies of the era. The history of the American West was filled with examples of white settlers and native tribes living side by side. In the Pueblos of New Mexico, in the fur trading posts of the Pacific Northwest, in, in parts of Western Texas and California, Settlers from Mexico, France, Canada, and the United States had created societies in which Indians and whites mixed in relative coexistence, usually out of necessity. White paternalism, a concept I'd mentioned previously, was ultimately what powered federal Indian removal policies. 
the belief that the American government was acting in the best long-term interest of natives by compelling them to move west. Hundreds of thousands of white and black Americans traveled to the far western regions of the continent between 1840 and 1860, hundreds of thousands. Many were from the old northwest. They were relatively young and they traveled in family groups. Many were relatively prosperous, but poor people made the trip as laborers, as servants, as teachers, as farmhands, and as prostitutes. Groups heading for areas where mining or lumbering was a principal economic activity consisted mostly of men. Men like Horace Greeley, and many other promoters, Horace Greeley, made their living promoting Western migration and settlement in Eastern and foreign newspapers, staking out faster routes, selling maps to others, and serving as guides for the journey. Go west, they said, before you are fitted for no life but that of the factory. Western migrants generally gathered at one of a handful of major depots in Iowa or Missouri and joined a wagon train led by hired guides and set off with their belongings piled into covered wagons with their livestock trailing behind. The major route, and there were many, the major route was the 2000 mile Oregon Trail, which stretched from Independence, Missouri, across the Great Plains, over the Rocky Mountains, and through to California or to Oregon. Oregon Trail. Other migrations moved along the old Santa Fe Trail, southwest from Missouri and into New Mexico. Westward migration was always arduous and usually lasted nearly half a year, typically May to November when the weather was most suitable for the journey. The risk of encountering snow while crossing the Rockies stoked fear among the migrants. Most everyone walked to lighten the load for their horses and cholera decimated many groups. Despite the journey's hardships, many travelers found the journey to be a communal experience. They tended to move west with neighbors and friends, and the value of cooperation on the trail was important for survival. Only a handful of settlers actually experienced Indian attacks on their journey. One-tenth of one percent of settlers died from conflict with the tribes, while a much larger number of migrants benefited from Indian guides, Indian horse traders, and Indian fresh food couriers. Texas exemplifies the conflict of interest initiated by American territorial expansion. White settlers who had legally secured the Mexican region claimed Texas and as an independent republic in 1836 under increased pressure from Mexico's dictator, the General Santa Ana. At the Battle of San Jacinto, General Sam Houston and his band of American settler Tejanos defeated the Mexican army and took Santa Ana prisoner. Battle of San Jacinto, I mentioned Sam Houston. Their independence secured, President Sam Houston sent delegates to Washington to apply for American statehood. Andrew Jackson, fearing that adding a large slave state to the Union, Texas, would only increase sectional tensions, blocked the annexation and even delayed recognizing the Republic of Texas as an independent nation. The annexation of Texas. Texas attracted the attention of England and France who saw an opportunity to keep the upstart United States in check by aligning themselves with the new Republic of Texas. In 1844, another effort to secure statehood for Texas was denied, this time by northern U.S. senators opposed to yet another cotton-growing slave state joining the Union. Up in the Pacific Northwest, both Great Britain and the United States claimed sovereignty still, but by the 1840s, Americans dwarfed the number of British settlers, especially up and down the Pacific coast. Americans had also devastated much of the Indian population through the accidental transmission of measles, leaving the territory largely open to full American ownership. In the presidential election of 1844, James K. Polk, Democrat in the style of Jackson, ran on the platform that the reoccupation of Oregon in the Pacific Northwest and the reannexation of Texas at the earliest practicable period are the great American measures. James K. Polk. By combining the Oregon and Texas questions, the Democrats appealed to both Northern and Southern expansionists and won the election handily in 1844. Polk secured congressional assent to annex Texas in 1845, and despite more English saber rattling, uh, they talked the British into drawing a line on the 49th parallel, which, which will divide Canada and the United States in 1846, the line we understand today as the northern boundary of the United States. This annexation of Texas prompted a break in diplomatic relations between Mexico and Washington. Further disputes over the boundary between the two countries only inflamed tensions. General Zachary Taylor and his army were sent to Texas to protect the new state against a possible Mexican invasion. General Zachary Taylor. 
Mexico was worried about its claim on New Mexico, whose flourishing multiracial society had become more and more American after an important trade relationship developed between Santa Fe and Independence, Missouri, where all those settlers were, were launching from. California, too, was becoming increasingly American, although it was not American in this era. First, it was the crews of whaling ships stopping there for provisions. Then it was the white merchants who opened up stores to sell goods to the Mexican and Indians who lived there. Then it was pioneering families who entered California from the East Coast and settled near Sacramento, the eventual capital. These families dreamed of bringing California under the jurisdiction of the United States, and President Polk had the same aspirations. After he sent General Taylor to Texas, he secretly ordered the commander of the Pacific Naval Squadron to seize California's ports if Mexico declared war on the United States. Word was quietly sent to American settlers that uh, if there were an uprising against the Mexican army there, it would be supported by American troops. That'll eventually become the Bear Flag Revolt. Having prepared for war, James K. Polk prodded the Mexicans into conflict by sending troops across the border and to the edge of the Rio Grande River. After months of inactivity, Americans accused the Mexican troops of crossing their side of the river, and war was declared by the United States Congress, and only a handful of congressmen voting against authorization. Critics charged Polk with deliberately inciting the conflict with Mexico, and the number of opponents grew as casualties, the expense, and the length of the conflict with Mexico increased and stretched into East Texas, marked by the runaway scrape and the massacre at the Alamo, which will kill Davy Crockett, folk hero. Once war had been declared, Americans moved quickly to try to seize California, New Mexico, Texas, and even Mexico itself. The city of Santa Fe, New Mexico, was seized without opposition. The American Navy helped settlers take California in that Bear Flag Revolt, and General Winfield Scott advanced 260 miles along the Mexican National Highway, seizing Mexico City. Under pressure to annex much of Mexico itself and make Mexico property of the United States or territory of the United States, uh, Polk sent a special envoy to Mexico to sign a peace treaty. Under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexico agreed to see California and New Mexico to the United States and to forever recognize Texas all the way to the Rio Grande, but no further. James K. Polk tried to be a president whose poli policies transcended sectional divisions. But by repeatedly placating the sections, he gradually earned the mistrust of Northerners and Westerners. Polk supported a proposal to extend the Missouri Compromise Line through the new territories all the way to the, to the Pacific Coast, all the way out west, the Mason-Dixon Line, banning slavery north of the line and permitting it southward. Others supported a plan of popular sovereignty, which would allow the people of each territory to decide the status of slavery within their own state. Both Democrats and Whigs in this era tried to avoid the issue of slavery, especially leading up to the 1848 election, which pitted Polk's successor against General Zachary Taylor, the man who had led the army into Mexico. Opponents of slavery formed the Free Soil Party. I mentioned that concept before, but we'll, we'll have a Free Soil Party now, not just an ideology, the Free Soil Party. Opponents of slavery formed that Free Soil Party and they nominated the former President Martin Van Buren. Though Taylor won the election, the Free Soilers earned over 10% of the popular vote and picked up 10 congressional seats across the country highlighting the inability of the existing political parties to contain political passions as slavery was creating and foreshadowing the eventual collapse of the second party system. President Franklin Pierce, who succeeded Taylor after stomach illness killed him, hoped to dampen the sectional controversy about slavery by supporting a movement in the Democratic Party known as Young America, the Young America Movement. Its adherents saw the expansion of American democracy throughout the world as a way to divert attention from the controversies over slavery. They dreamed of acquiring new territories in the Western Hemisphere and extending the American empire in all directions across the globe. Every effort to secure new territory in places like Cuba, Hawaii, and Canada inflamed sectional tensions from one side of the slavery question or the other and failed to gain much traction in Congress. As the Young America movement failed to gain political power, uh, filibustering grew in popularity, filibustering. Uh, these were privately financed uh, schemes that were directed at capturing and occupying foreign territory without the approval of the US government with the hopes of eventually getting the government on board and to, to capture these, ter these foreign territories. The hope with the Young America movement was, who cares about slavery within these small states? Let's take this empire global. Uh, and we can, we have bigger fish to fry than slavery in a sense. We, we need to conquer the world was the idea. Quite different from the typical westward migratory experience, the California gold rush, 
was set off by the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in California and attracted tens of thousands of 49ers who were ill-prepared men from all over the country and even all over the world who flooded the California territory uh, uh, en masse. While few were actually struck at rich, many men stayed in California and swelled the urban, urban populations of the territory. Chinese, Europeans, South Africans, Mexicans, Indians, free blacks were drawn to the territory also to wash the laundry, cook the food, and fill the vacuum typically filled by women, making the territory an unusually turbulent and raucous American outpost. An 1849 effort by Zachary Taylor to admit California as a free state drew the ire of southern slave states who understood the free slave state balance stood at 15 states apiece. If California became a free state, the emerging territories of Utah, New Mexico, and Oregon seemed likely to follow suit, which would further tip the balance of power in favor of the free states. Even many otherwise moderate southern leaders now began to talk about secession from the Union, sensing that the direction would move anti-slavery. In the North, every state legislature but one had adopted a resolution demanding the prohibition, prohibition of slavery in all new territories. Debates over expansion, economics, diplomacy, and manifest destiny exposed some of the weaknesses of the American system. The chauvinism of policies like Native American removal, the Mexican War, and filibustering existed alongside a growing national anxiety. Manifest Destiny attempted to make a virtue of America's lack of history and turn it into the very basis of nationhood. To locate such origins, John O'Sullivan and other champions of Manifest Destiny grafted biological and territorial imperatives, common among European definitions of nationalism, onto American political culture. The United States was the embodiment of the democratic ideal, they said. Democracy had to be timeless, boundless, and portable. New methods of transportation and communications, the rapidity of the railroad and the telegraph, the rise of the international market economy, and the growth of the American frontier provided shared platforms to help Americans think about local identities and affirm a national character that was different from the rest of the world. Their effort to unite America expanded America, but could not forestall the civil conflict coming.